أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. One of the very disturbing phenomena that we are experiencing in our modern times is the attempt to replace religion, religious practices, religious rituals with non-religious practices. For instance, I am witnessing in our era the attempt to replace spirituality in religion, prayer, dua, supplication, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorification of God, that being replaced, for instance, with yoga. I know many people, and their intentions are good. I'm not here in a position to judge them. They are searching for spirituality through yoga. I find people in some of our communities who are Muslims. They do not pray. They have no clue what Sahifa Sajjadiya is. They have not taken the time and effort to explore the spirituality of Dua Abu Hamza Thimali, for example, or Dua al iftitah And they resort to yoga. And when you ask them why, they'll tell you, because I want to be spiritual and through yoga, I want to connect to my creator. Now, the environment in some of these yoga sessions is a pretty disturbing environment. The typical environment is they go to a gym in a room with the opposite gender, wearing their tightest clothes that they can and dancing to music. MashaAllah for the spirituality. Inshallah, straight to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are trying to replace religion with these types of practices. Now yoga, as a physical exercise, breathing technique, a lady who's pregnant and has back pain and the doctor tells her to observe some yoga moves, that's fine. But if I want to take spirituality from yoga, that's not how it works. No prophet of Allah, no religion advocated for that. This does not give you spirituality to connect to your creator. You want spirituality, it must go through the path that Allah has given you. Through Quran, through supplication, through the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the du'as of Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam. That's how you achieve spirituality. And then we find rituals invented in these non-religious practices. For instance, do you know that you have the yoga chakra rug? It looks like a prayer rug. They sell it. Go and check it out. Subhanallah. They have this rug so you can do these yoga moves. And the prayer rug is for us an opportunity to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's replace all of that. Forget your daily prayer. Go sit on a yoga rug and you can have your own meditation. Even many types of meditation today are used to replace religion. One type of meditation is blank meditation. When you sit and you do nothing, you sit there in a certain gesture, posture, you're familiar with it, right? And for an hour, you're supposed to think of nothing and do nothing. Just go blank in your mind. Now in Islam, we don't have such type of meditation. Islamic purposeful meditation is when you sit, you review your day, you examine how you can better yourself, you think of the akhirah, you think of death, that's good meditation. 
You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's good meditation. But for you to sit an hour and do nothing, that is not purposeful medication. No prophet of God ever advocated for that. But we are told in modern society, you don't need dua, you don't need prayer, you don't need salah, just sit and meditate and you're fine. Another attempt at replacing religion is what is called manifestation and certain aspects of the law of attraction. And in our discussion tonight, we will examine the law of attraction. As Muslims, how do we make sense of this law? Is there truth to it? What is it that we accept from this law and what is it that we reject? Now let's briefly define the law of attraction and see how there is an attempt to use it to replace religion. In very simple terms, the law of attraction means when you have positive thoughts, a positive mindset, you can attract good positive outcomes. Now there are many variations of this law. You will find books written on this law. But at a very basic level, that's what it means. The law of attraction also means that your thoughts create feelings. You can create positive feelings or negative feelings. If you create positive feelings, you will generate positive vibrations in the universe and you will attract good outcomes that match these vibrations. And if you have negative thoughts, you will create negative feelings. And once you create negative feelings, you will generate negative vibrations in the universe and that will attract negative outcomes that match that vibration. That is the basic principle of the law of attraction. Let's now take our Islamic glasses and analyze this law from an Islamic perspective. Do we entirely reject this law? Or there are aspects of this law that we can accept and then there are aspects that are problematic that we reject and we in fact see it as an attempt to replace religion today. Let's start with four concerns that we have with the law of attraction. Number one, when we examine the law of attraction, we find that in reality there is an attempt to remove God from the picture. Because many types or variations of the law of attraction, they tell you that if you keep thinking of positive things, you keep wishing for something, somehow, mysteriously, the universe is going to deliver that to you. The universe is going to make it happen to you. Now when I ask them, who exactly is the universe? When you say the universe is going to do wonders for you, if you have a positive mindset, let's say all you think of is to become a millionaire or to become the CEO of X company and you think of this every single day. Every single day that's on your mind. You think of it, you think of it. The law of attraction says eventually the universe will use all of its mysterious powers to make that happen. So my question is, when you say the universe, who are you referring to? Who's the universe? Mars? Jupiter? The Milky Way galaxy? A black hole somewhere in the universe? Who's the universe that you're referring to? So in reality, you find that there is an attempt to remove God from the picture and tell you that wonders will happen in your life, but it's the universe that will make it happen. This contradicts the teachings of the monotheistic religions that tell us Allah is in charge. Who created the universe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This whole system of cause and effect, God is the one who created that. Allah has a system, He's determined many variables and yes, He's given you some free will to determine your own fate too. But everything in the universe is in the hands of Allah. Nothing happens without a cause. Nothing happens without a variable that Allah has created. Allah states in the Holy Quran, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِّن قَبْلِ أَنَّ بْرَأَهَا Anything that happens, even misfortunes, 
calamities, tragedies, problems, trials, whether on earth, on land, or in your own nafs, in your own self, Allah has a record of it. Allah knows of it. He's written it in a book. So nothing mysteriously happens in the universe without God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate guide and cause in this universe. So that is the first observation that we have when it comes to the law of attraction. It seems that there is an attempt to remove God from the picture. There's no God. Just wish for good things and somehow the universe is going to make it happen. That's not how it works. Who is the universe that you're referring to? Allah is the one who can make things happen. So that's the first observation. The second observation, yes, we will get to the positives of this law and some of the advantages of this law. We'll talk about that. When you think of something and you're positive, you are more likely to achieve it. However, it does not mean that anything you wish for and you think of, you will get it. Sometimes Allah will intervene and it will not happen. Even if you think of it a hundred times a day. Because sometimes Allah sees that this is not good for you. If you're a mu'min, if you're a believer, and you're asking for something that is not good for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may stop it. So it's not true that any time you wish for something or you constantly, positively think of something, you will get it. Many times you will and you will not get it because it's not in your interest or Allah wants to try you. So that's the second observation we have. The third observation is that some people, when trying to implement the law of attraction, they fall into the trap of wishful thinking. When you read about manifestation and the law of attraction, sometimes you hear youth on social media discussing it this way or thinking about it this way. That you basically just sit in your room and a hundred times a day think of getting that job and eventually you'll get it. That's not how the world works. You have to make the effort. Positive thinking by itself will not give you results. It must be coupled with action. Allah states in the Holy Quran, وَأَن لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى You will not get except that which you work for. So I feel some of the youth, they fall into this trap. They think, why should I go to college and get a PhD and work so hard to establish a business? I mean, let me sit in my house and think of becoming a millionaire for six months, for a year, and somehow, inshallah, I'll become a millionaire. That's not how it works. This is wishful thinking. Be positive. Think positively. Have hope. Work hard. But that's the key. Work hard. Without working hard, you will not get anywhere. You must make the effort. So this is the trap that some people fall into when they embrace the law of attraction and the world of manifestation. The fourth concern that we have with the law of attraction is that you are basically given the impression, and this can be very toxic, my dear brothers and sisters, that if you are going through trials and difficulties in your life, it's because you're not positive enough. I hear some people say that. You're going through a disease, financial crisis, family crisis, because your mindset is not a proper mindset. Start having a positive mindset, all your problems will be solved. That is not true. Sometimes you have people who are very optimistic, very positive. They have the best mindset, but Allah is trying them through that health crisis, financial crisis, family crisis. If Allah loves one of his servants, a human being, Allah will drown him in bala. Allah will drown him in difficulty, in hardship. I know this is very difficult for us to digest. How could a loving, merciful Lord do that? But it's because He's merciful and loving that He's doing that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your ultimate coach. Allah sees your weaknesses and through these trials, Allah is inviting you to address your weaknesses. And that's what a good coach does. You as a good coach, if you're coaching one of your team members to play ping pong table, table tennis, whatever it is, and you realize that player has a weakness in his left arm. 
You as a good coach, where do you keep striking? Right side or left side? Which side? Left side, right? Why? Is it to embarrass that team member? Because you are going to embarrass him a few times. Is it to make him suffer because you enjoy seeing him suffer? You realize that he has a weakness in his left arm. So you'll keep striking on the left side for him to strengthen his left arm. Because that's what a good coach does. If you have a personal trainer at a gym, halal gym inshallah. If you have a personal trainer, who's a good trainer? A trainer who gets you to your goal in the most efficient way possible. Imagine if one day you show up to the gym, to your trainer, and the trainer says, Habibi, I've got very good news for you. Today, no pain, no suffering, no five-hour difficult workout. I brought you a pizza. Let's sit and watch a movie for the next five hours. Will you accept that? If you get a refund, maybe. But will you accept that? You will tell him, that's not why I came here. I did not come here to eat pizza. I came here for a good workout. In fact, I want you to make me suffer. I came here to suffer because I have a goal. I want to be fit. I want to shed X amount of pounds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He makes you suffer, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is elevating you. He's coaching you. He's strengthening you. So if you're going through problems and trials in your life, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a bad mindset. You have a corrupted mindset. You're not positive enough as some people claim. For some people, that may be the case, but for others, that may not be the case. Sometimes you could be the most positive person, but Allah wants to try you. Allah wants to elevate you. So we find these four concerns, my dear brothers and sisters, with the law of attraction. Having said that, let's now examine what we as Muslims can accept from the law of attraction. Because there are positive elements of it that we can accept. In fact, way before the law of attraction, you find verses in the Holy Quran and hadiths from the Prophet and his family that have pointed to some of these points that people today attribute to the law of attraction. Let's examine them. Number one, the law of attraction tells you that when you have a positive mindset and you act upon it, you generate vibrations in the universe. And those vibrations attract certain outcomes that match the vibration. Is there any truth to that? Yes, there is truth to that to an extent. When you, a human being, when you commit a deed, when you do an action in this life, there is a ripple effect to this action that can reach the other side of the universe. And that invites you to re-examine what you do during your day. Sometimes I think my action is very limited. It's just in my room, in my house, in my community. But in reality, it has a ripple impact effect that can reach the other side of the universe. That's how powerful your deed can be. In one of the ziyaras of Imam Hussein, which as Shaykh al-Saduq rahmatullahi alayhi states, it's the most, most authentic ziyarah of Imam Hussein. There's a powerful passage that states the following. Ashhadu anna damaka sakana fil khuld waqsha'arrat lahu adhillatu al-arsh ma'a adhillatu al-khala'iq. In one of the visitations of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, you say, Oh Aba Abdullah, I bear witness that your blood that was spilled unjustly, that your blood, it reached eternity. And it dwells eternity. Your blood became eternal. The shadows or the shades of God's throne were shaken. And the shadows of creation, meaning all of creation was shaken. The martyrdom of Imam Hussein was so significant. The act of killing him was so evil, it shook the entire universe. If you were able to see the reality of this universe, if you could see behind the veils, the metaphysical aspect of this universe, you would see the universe shaken to its core when Imam Hussein was killed. And even our daily sins, my dear brothers and sisters, according to one hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Prophet Jesus alayhi salam, He tells him, Oh Isa, when a person takes a false oath in me, 
you take an oath in Allah and you lie. Lying is a big sin. Now when you take a false oath in God's name, it's even a bigger sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Prophet Isa salam, the one who takes a false oath in my name, my throne is shaken by that. That means you small little creature here on earth, with this sin you can shake the throne of God. And to the contrary, to the opposite, if you do a good deed, it has a ripple impact in the universe. It has a ripple effect. It generates positivity throughout the universe. And the system behind that is angels. The angels take your good deeds and they take it to the arsh of Allah. They take it to the heavens. Your good deeds generate a vibration, a spiritual vibration in the universe that the entire universe can feel your good deeds. So this aspect is something that we can embrace and we can accept because we have teachings in Islam that point to this direction. And this should remind us never to underestimate our deeds. Never underestimate it. Imagine, imagine the inhabitants of the universe. And we don't know who's out there in the universe. Billions and trillions of angels, heavenly creatures, there may be life out there. Imagine your deed impacting all of that. That's big. And imagine your good deeds sending these good signals to the universe. So this first aspect of the law of attraction is something that, yes, we can accept. Let's move to the second point. The second aspect is the, the positive element in the law of attraction tells you that with op optimism, with a positive mindset, you can achieve anything. Yes, there is some truth to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam teaches us to realize our full potential. Never put a limitation for yourself. Allah has created you. Allah has given you faculties. Allah has given you so many different powers and capacities. Realize your full potential. The problem of the average human being is that he or she underestimates their potential. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib famously and beautifully said in these lines of poetry that are attributed to him. You presume, you claim that you're some small entity. I'm just a small little human being here on earth. But in reality, the big universe is enfolded in you. Don't underestimate yourself. The entire universe is enfolded in you. Which means you, the human being, you have a great capacity. You can be connected to your Lord, to your Creator. Allah is infinite. And when you connect yourself to an infinite source, the results can be infinite. Don't presume you're just some small entity. Don't put limitations on yourself. With a strong willpower, you can achieve anything. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib also said, Have you seen how a bird flies? The Imam says, you can also fly. Now, not with physical wings, but with your willpower. With your willpower, you have the capacity to fly. You can achieve anything. Yes, be realistic, but you can achieve anything. So this is something that we fully embrace in the religion of Islam. Never underestimate yourself. Never say, I'm not able to do that. I can't pull this off. You can. Be strong, have the willpower, and ask Allah to help you and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do wonders for you. In 1954, an interesting record was broken. It was believed before 1954 that no human being would be able to run a mile in less than four minutes. Impossible. Human beings just don't have the physical stamina and the physical capacity to achieve that, to pull that off. What happened in 1954? In 1954, this record was broken by the British athlete Roger Bannister. He managed to run a mile in three minutes and 53 seconds. He broke the record. Now here's the interesting part. In the next 12 months, 
over 20 runners were able to run a mile in less than four minutes. Why? What changed? The mile is still the same mile. It's not like they shortened the mile, right? The bodies are the same bodies. How come before 1954, those runners could not pull it off? But once Roger Bannister pulled it off, 20 other athletes pulled it off too within the next year. Why? What happened? What changed? Perception. Before 1954, they believed it was impossible. And when you believe something is impossible, it becomes impossible. You're very unlikely to do that which you think is impossible. But now that you had a human being break that record, it was proof to them that you can. If Roger did it, why can't I? Because they believed in their capacity to break that record, they in fact broke that record. That shows you that the human being puts limitations on himself. When you remove those limitations, you can achieve the unthinkable. Another example is in 1939, there was a math student or a student in statistics and math by the name of George Danzig. Have you heard of George Danzig? He was a very famous mathematician and statistician. What he did in 1939 was amazing. One day he goes to class at the University of California in Berkeley. He goes to class late. So he sees two problems on the board. He writes them down. He goes home to solve them. These, this is his homework. Now he realized that the problems were a bit too difficult. They were not your average homework problem. But he manages to solve them and he submits it to his professor, his teacher. His teacher goes crazy. After a while when the professor was grading it and he realized he solved it, he contacted him. Come, Ro George, what's going on here? He told him, what do you mean? He's like, how did you solve this? He's like, well, I admit it was a bit difficult, but I solved it. Why? He's like, no, really, how did you solve it? He's like, I solved it. This is the homework that you gave us and I solved it. What's the big deal? He told him, no, that was not your homework. He's like, then what was it? He's like, I was giving an example of two open problems in math and statistics that no one has been able to solve. Not even Einstein has been able to solve it. I was giving an example of that. He's like, oh, I thought that was my homework. And his, his professor was fascinated and he told him, these two problems make that your thesis. This is amazing. You discovered an answer. No scientist has ever done that before. Why was George Danzig able to do that? What was different about him in class that day from other classmates? Other classmates, the minute their professor told them these are problems Einstein couldn't even solve, that's it. The brain shuts down. The ambition shuts down. If these are open-ended problems, open problems in math, and no one has been able to solve them, who am I to solve them? See, you put the limitation. It's a mental barrier limitation that you put on yourself. Whereas George, he came late to class, so he thought it was a math problem, homework. Obviously, your teacher, when he gives you homework, you can do it. Teachers are not going to give you homework that you cannot solve. So in his mind, he was sure that you could solve it because it's my homework. Because he was so sure of solving it, he actually solved it. And that shows you the power of willpower, it can do wonders. As Amir al-Mu'mineen stated, you can fly with your two wings. Just like a bird flies with its two wings. But your wings are your himma, are your willpower, your ambition. So one positive element in the law of attraction is that if you focus on positive ideas, a positive mindset, you can actually achieve good results. And that's something that we believe in. The power of belief, the power of, the power of Iman. Your niyyah and your intention can do wonders. As an Imam al-Sadiq beautifully states, مَا ضَعُفَ بَدَنٌ عَلَى مَا قَوِيَتْ عَلَيْهِ النِّيَّةِ If your body is weak, your niyyah is strong. Your niyyah can compensate. Meaning your willpower can compensate. Your positive thinking can compensate for that. How do you think Ali ibn Abi Talib lifted the door of Khaybar? When the Imam 
would barely eat any food. How did he do that? Many people ask. It's the power of his iman. It's the power of his faith. When he felt connected to Allah and he wanted to bring the victory of Allah, he had the power of 40 men to carry the gate of Khaybar. That's what willpower can do to you. So this is a positive element that we can accept. Number three. One of the elements of the law of attraction is what's called good karma or bad karma. In Islam, do we believe in the system of karma? At a basic level, without going into the details of other religions, what Hinduism says, what Buddhism says. No, at a basic level. That when you do something, it will come back to you. If it's good, you'll receive good results. If it's bad, you'll receive bad results. What goes around, comes around. Do we believe in that at a basic level? Absolutely. I'll share with you several verses from the Quran to demonstrate that. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah at tawbah verse 98, He speaks about those hypocrite Bedouins, A'rab. Allah describes one of their qualities. وَمِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مَا يُنْفِقُ مَغْرَمًا Some of those Bedouin A'rab, they believe that when they donate to charity, it's a loss for them. It's a fine. Like I'm getting fined. Zakat is like a fine. You know when you get fined by the police? They believe that donating charity, zakat, khums, sadaqah, fitrah, whatever it is, that is actually a fine. They hated that. And then the Quran states, وَيَتَرَبَّصُونَ بِكُمُ الدَّوَائِرِ They wish misfortune on the believers. Because they're hypocrites, they would wish that bad things happen to the believers. The Quran says, Alayhim da'ira to so. The misfortune is going to hit them. What does this verse indicate? This verse indicates that when you wish evil on others, this act of wishing evil on others is actually going to go back and haunt you one day. That's very important. Intentions are very important. I could be sitting in my house and not harming anyone. But I sit and I wish my cousin is destroyed. Right? My friend, I wish he'd die and he'd lose his wealth and he'd fail his MCAT. Because I didn't get the score that I wanted and he's going to outcompete me. You're not doing anything. In fact, you don't even talk to your friends about it. You keep it in your heart. But you sit there and wish evil. Honestly, you're not generating good vibrations in the universe when you do that. And this was the quality of those A'rab. They wish that bad things happen to the believers. Allah responds to them and threatens them by saying, The misfortune is going to hit them. Because when you wish evil on people, eventually the evil is going to come back to you. This is one of the laws of the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one verse. Another verse is Surah Fatir, verse 43. Allah states, Istikbaran fil ardi wa makra sayyi' wa la yahiqu al makra sayyi'u illa bi ahli. There are some people, they're arrogant, and they scheme evil plots. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَكْرُ السَّيِّئُ إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ These evil plots that you concoct, they will come back to strike you and they will engulf you and they will affect you. And that's the basic law of karma. You plot evil plots for other people, eventually those plots will come to get you. They will come to hurt you. They'll come to make you fail. So this part of the law of attraction is something that we can accept. Yes. If you have a negative evil mindset and you wish evil on people and in fact you act upon this evil mindset, it will come back to attract negativity to you. It will attract shayateen to you. That is something that we Muslims believe in. Another verse in the Holy Quran also refers to this law of karma that affects your family. God forbid. Allah states in Surah An-Nisa verse 9, وَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ فَلْيَتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَلْيَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا Allah states 
before you say something evil and bad, like you ruin someone's reputation, you cause fitna, ghiba, namima, you name it. And before you do something bad in society, think of your progeny. Think of your future family. Because it's the law of this world, it's the law of Allah, that when you do good to other families, the world will be structured by Allah to do good to your family and to your children. And when you harm other families, there is a threat to us. Your family can be harmed in the future. That is the basic law of karma. Be good to others, others will be good to your future children, to your future family. And if you are bad to other people, your children might be in a negative environment and they will be the target of a lot of hate. Sometimes we think we're strong, I have a strong social position, I have the connections, I oppress this family, that family, I cause fitna, I ruin this life. Be careful. Maybe in your lifetime you'll get away with it in dunya, of course not on the day of judgment, but your family will suffer one day. And subhanAllah, we've seen that happening every single day around the world. This is one of the laws of this life, my dear brothers and sisters. So this is an aspect that we can accept. Karma does exist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created this system. In ahsantum, ahsantum, the anfusakum. Do good, you'll be doing good to yourself. And if you do bad, when asatum, if you do good, you do bad, you will be the first victim of your evil deeds. That is the basic law of karma. And this should make us think twice before we do something wrong, my dear brothers and sisters. So this aspect of the law of attraction is something that we can definitely accept. Being optimistic in itself is something that we accept. Many studies have shown that when people who are optimistic, their rates of depression are less. Their health is better. They're happier. Be optimistic. You as a mu'min, you have Allah. Something that maybe others don't have that connection. One of the most beautiful Statements in the Quran for me is this one, my dear brothers and sisters. The Muslim army was suffering at the time of the Prophet. In the battlefield, they're being attacked by these pagans. They were bleeding, suffering. You know how Allah comforted them? It's such a beautiful statement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, look, if you are suffering, you're bleeding, you're fatigued, you're exhausted, you have casualties. Your enemy is also suffering. They also have casualties. They're also bleeding. But then, but then look at the Quran. وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ But what you hope from Allah is something that they don't. They don't believe in God. They don't believe there is heaven and hell. They're suffering, but they don't believe anyone was going to compensate them. You die and you become dust. This was the belief of the pagans. But you, the believer, you're suffering. You have Allah. You know God is watching. He's there. He's acknowledging your pain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to compensate you. Can you compare that with an atheist who has no such belief? Can you compare that? My dear brothers and sisters, you know, one of the biggest crimes of atheism is what? It literally is a crime. I know legally it's not a crime. But if you look at it from a humanitarian perspective, it's a crime. I'll give you this example. Imagine if there's a child suffering. A child who was born with a disability. And this child is suffering every day. You know what the atheist tells him? Now, the atheist may not say these words. But the atheistic belief boils down to that. You know what the atheist tells that child? Hey buddy, look, you're suffering too bad. There's no God up there. There's no day of judgment. You're going to suffer and suffer till you die and too bad. That's just how the world works. And nobody's going to compensate you on the day of judgment. Contrast that to a believer who comes to the boy and says, Habibi, life is short. You're suffering, but you have Allah. He acknowledges your pain. And then on the day of judgment for infinity, Allah will put you in the highest ranks of heaven. Can you compare between these two? Wallah, that first one is a crime. When you tell suffering people that's it, suffer for the rest of your life, too bad, you're going to become dust and there's no compensation, that's a crime against their humanity. 
If you don't know whether God is there or not, just shut up and don't say anything. Don't go and say there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no compensation. When you say that, that's an act of crime. Forgive me, but this is the reality, my dear brothers and sisters. That's the reality. That's why atheism is a crime. You're basically telling the whole world and anybody out there who's suffering, that's it, too bad. You're just unlucky, too bad. There's no compensation for you whatsoever. Don't say that. Don't say God doesn't exist. How do you know God doesn't exist? That's the peak of arrogance and ignorance. The most thing you want to say, don't say it. But if you need to talk, okay, say, I don't know. I don't know. But don't come out and say God does not exist. That's a crime. Spiritually, that's a crime. Intellectually, that's a crime. You are harassing billions of people who are suffering when you tell them God doesn't exist. That's the reality. That is the reality. That's why Islam considers atheism the peak of arrogance and irresponsibility. So my dear brothers and sisters, when we examine the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we examine the law of attraction, we do find that there are many elements that we can accept. But again, we cannot use this to replace religion. We cannot use this to eliminate God from the picture and say that the universe somehow mysteriously is going to do wonders for you. That's not how it works. And then finally, my dear brothers and sisters, whenever you discuss this topic with your friends, manifestation, law of attraction, one of the most powerful elements is dua. Never underestimate the power of dua. You know, they tell you wish for positive things and it happens. Yes, that's true, but that happens through dua. When you resort to Allah and you pray for the best and you wish for the best, never lose hope. Never ever lose hope from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the message of the month of Ramadan, my dear brothers and sisters. Never lose hope. Never underestimate the power of dua. A dua is game changer. Even if there's a fate that's written for you, even if there's a tragedy that's coming your way, it's imminent. One dua from your sincere heart can change all of that. The Quran says if it weren't for your supplications and duas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would not have blessed you the way He is blessing you. And dua is not only for Muslims. Non-Muslims also, they have their own way of dua and connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if a non-Muslim supplicates to Allah, Allah may answer them. Anyone who connects to Allah, Allah may answer them. Dua is one of the most powerful tools that Allah has given you as a believer. That's what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam states. Ya man ismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa. Silahuhu, silahuhu, your power, your weapon is your tears and your dua. Tears because it indicates you're sincere. When your heart is broken and you do dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that from you. My dear brothers and sisters, about 50 years ago, and I'll conclude by sharing this incident with you. About 50 years ago, there was a boy in Kuwait who was playing with his friends. Unfortunately, on that day, as he was playing, kids were playing, you know, those old guns with the plastic dart. What do you call those guns? Nerf guns? Yeah? Let's say the Nerf guns. This 10-year-old boy got shot in his right eye with that Nerf dart. So they took him to the hospital. And for 40 days, he was hospitalized. One day, the doctor, who was a Palestinian Christian doctor, he was not a Muslim doctor, he said to the father of this boy, look, your son is losing his eyesight. I can't do anything. We doctors cannot do anything. So whatever you believe in, your God, your religion, go and pray. I can't do anything anymore. Now, the mother of the boy at that time was in Karbala for ziyara. So the father of the boy calls his wife, the mother of the boy. 
And he tells her what the doctor said. He told her, you're in Karbala, go and supplicate. The mother of the boy, she goes barefoot to the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. And she goes to the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And she begs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure her son on that day. The next day, the next day, the Palestinian Christian doctor calls the father of the boy. Come to the hospital quickly. What happened? He asked him, I have one question for you. What did you do last night? I told him, I didn't do anything special. I mean, I supplicated. But I called his mom and I asked her to go to the blessed shrines and she made a special prayer. He told him, I want to tell you that your son has been healed and now his vision has been restored. What is it that you did? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. That's the power of dua. My dear brothers and sisters, this is not a story from some anonymous book. That boy is my father, Sayyid Hassan. May Allah bless him. And I heard this story directly from my grandfather who's in Karbala. That is the power of dua. Never underestimate the power of dua. Especially in the month of Ramadan. The month of spirituality. When you open your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just have a few nights left. Go in the privacy of your room and pour your heart out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ilahi waqafa sa'iluna bibabik. This is one of the du'as that we recite in the month of Ramadan. Every night recite this. It gives you so much hope. Ilahi waqafa sa'iluna bibabik. وَلَا ذَا الْفُقَرَاءُ بِجَنَابِكَ وَوَقَفَتْ سَفِينَةُ الْمَسَاكِينَ عَلَى سَاحِلِ بَحْرِ جُودِكَ وَكَرَمِكَ Oh Allah, those who are in need, they're standing at your door. Oh Allah, the poor ones, we're all poor before Allah. They are knocking at your door. Oh Allah, the ship of the poor ones are now at the banks of your mercy. Allah, we're all on this ship. And we wish to cross the ocean to the other side, to your rahmah. Oh Allah, we have this hope. Ilahi, in kunta la tarhamu fi hadha al-shahr al-sharif illa man akhlas laka fi siyamihi wa qiyamih faman lil-muqassir al-mudnib إِذَا غَرِقَ فِي بَحْرِ ذُنُوبِهِ وَآثَامِهِ Oh Allah, in this blessed month of Ramadan, say this from your heart. If you only have mercy on those good ones, on the one who fasted and prayed impeccably, then what about me, Ya Allah? What about the sinful ones? We don't have a Lord, we also have a Lord. إِلَٰهِ إِن كُنْتَ لَا تَرْحَمُ إِلَّا الْمُطِيعِينَ فَمَنْ لِلْعَصِينَ وَإِن كُنْتَ لَا تَقْبَلُ إِلَّا مِنَ الْعَامِلِينَ فَمَنْ لِلْمُقَصِّرِينَ إِلَٰهِ رَبِحَ الصَّائِمُونَ those who fasted and observed the sanctity of this month, they have passed. They have achieved success. Thank Allah for giving you this tawfiq. And if you spent some nights of the month of Ramadan and Layali al-Qad standing on your two feet and supplicating to Allah, you're the victorious one. Ilahi rabih al-sa'imun wa faaz al-qa'imun ونحن عبيدك المذنبون فارحمنا يا الله واعتقنا من النار Oh Allah, have mercy on us. Oh Allah, free us from the fire of hell. My dear brothers and sisters, it has been a great honor for me to be with you the last few, might, few nights in the month of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, to accept your a'mal, 
please forgive me for any shortcomings. Inshallah, the, the program will continue until tomorrow night, the English program. Our dear brother, Hajj Ali Abu Khidr, is going to deliver the lecture tomorrow night. But inshallah, you have a blessed remainder of the month of Ramadan. Inshallah, you have a blessed Eid. We expect the Eid, inshallah, to be on Wednesday for the followers of all Maraja. But on Tuesday night, you can check to verify that. But we expect it, inshallah, this year to be a unified Eid for everyone. So I ask Allah to bless you. And I congratulate you on the Eid. And inshallah, after Eid, I will be heading back to the holy city of Najaf. I will be praying for you in the shrine of Amir al muminin alayhi salam. And especially when I go to Karbala, I specifically would like to thank the NYC volunteers. You don't know how much time and effort they put in making this program a successful program every single night. I know some of them would get two hours of sleep during the day. But they were dedicated, volunteering, and helping out. So I ask you to recite a loud salawat for them, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.